Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. If you have a Bible, we're in Acts chapter 18. Uh, I'm not going to read it at the front end, but if you want to turn there, it'll help you. If you don't own a Bible or would like one, there's people walking down the aisles with Bibles. Just raise your hand and they'll, they'll give you one. But uh, if you want to follow along here in a few minutes, Acts chapter 18 is where we'll be. And uh, while you're turning there, let me just uh, ask you to be in prayer for my wife and I. I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, the last two days looking for a place to live, uh, looking for a place for us to gather. And so it's exciting to see the ball beginning to roll of us looking to plant a church in Washington, D.C., uh, we announced as a movement, uh, if you're not familiar with Passion, uh, Passion is a movement that began with young people. I went as a college student, uh, and then conferences began to rise up of gatherings of college students from all over the world uh, to worship God and to leverage their lives for what matters most. And uh, last year, we had over 50,000 18 to 25-year-olds in the Georgia Dome worshiping together uh, at Passion Conference, which was pretty amazing. This year, we can't use the Georgia Dome because they're closing it. Uh, and so there's two arenas in Georgia we're using. And then we announced last week that we'll have a gathering of over 3,000 young people in the middle of Washington, D.C., worshiping God together. So January 1st through 3rd, yeah. So... Uh, we're going to kind of roll in soft in the fall, and then we're going to come hard January 1 through 3. So pray for us uh, as we gather uh, the young people of our nation's capital in the name of Jesus. It's going to be pretty exciting. And thank you for all of you who've, who've been on that journey praying along with us. So let's pray together and then jump into what God has for us uh, today. Lord, thank you for this amazing church. <clears throat> thank you for the leadership. Thank you for all the people in these rooms together whose lives have been changed, not by FaithBridge per se, but by Jesus. But FaithBridge as it's championing your name is a house, is a place where we can all see our lives touched by the God who made us. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you for everybody here that maybe they're just visiting with family or maybe they just wandered in or maybe they're checking it out and spiritually you're in a lot of different places. We're all in different moments on the journey. But I thank you that we're here and I pray, God, as we talk th today, you would give us a sense of what you're doing in the world and how to be a part of it. And I pray our lives would be better as a result of these few minutes. And I want to ask you all, if you're willing, to pray that. And you ask him. Say, God, please teach us today. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I had trouble sleeping when I was in college. And so I would lay in bed at night and stare at the ceiling. And I realized that's a pretty lame thing to do. Counting sheep is no fun. And so I decided to have story time. And so I thought, I'm going to read myself bedtime stories. Textbooks aren't really good in this moment, but the Chronicles of Narnia sure was. And so my favorite bedtime stories to read to myself in college were the Chronicles of Narnia, which if you're not familiar with them, then that's your homework today. Go on Amazon and just download, buy them, take them home, read all of them, uh, because they're amazing. And if you're familiar with them, you know why. It's because C.S. Lewis, that Oxford Don who was an atheist and then became a Christian, wrote this series of allegories, stories about children who were called on an adventure by the great king, Aslan. And they're stories that are kind of thinly veiled allegories of great spiritual, emotional, practical realities we can learn about how to live our life, couched in these great little stories about talking animals and such. And so every night I would read them to myself. And I remember the night I read The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It was about Prince Caspian making the decision to gather together with a group of people, to bond together this little fellowship, and they were going to launch out into the unknown in the sea, go to uncharted places none had been before. And they were launching out together as a community to rescue some people who were in jeopardy. And so it was a mission of rescue. But then they had a separate 
Mission two, that as they went out on rescue, they were gonna continue sailing east until they reached the country of the great true king, Aslan. And I remember as I read that, watching these guys go through these adventures, learn together, fight together to do something worthwhile. I remember reading that, and in the midst of that journey, you see Prince Caspian, while he's about the purposes of the great king, he meets somebody. He meets a young lady that was a daughter of the stars, and they get married. And she joins them on the Dawn Treader, and they continue their adventures together. And I remember as a 19-year-old guy laying in bed, reading that, and I was like, that's what I want. I want to live my life with purpose, and I want my life to be about something. I want to be chasing the purposes of my king, and while I'm doing that, I want to meet somebody who is chasing him as much as I am. So I ask God, I want to marry somebody that's about the mission of God together, right? And I mention that today because that is so woven into the human heart, every human heart. Deep within the fabric of every one of us are the two desires to belong and to matter. Belonging and mattering are woven deep into our hearts. We want to be a part of something, a community that loves us. And we want to be a part of something, a cause that enraptures us, every one of us. We long for intimacy and we long for impact. And so all of our movies, all of our stories center around those two things and usually combine them both because those two issues of impact and intimacy, they are not just deeply woven into the human heart, they're deeply woven together. And the strongest communities, and you've seen this, the strongest sports teams, companies, military units, the strongest communities are those that are woven deeply to a compelling cause. And I mention that because it's the same is true for marriage. And Ken asked us to talk about relationships the last two weeks. So we talked about singleness last week and I wanted to talk about marriage this week. There's all kinds of stuff you could talk about with marriage, but here's the reality. When you enter marriage, it's a team. It's a community. And the strongest marriages, the most satisfying marriages, are a community that has a cause. Because every good team, every good business is going to have values and going to have vision. Values are what we believe and how we treat each other as a community. But vision is where we're going as a team. And what I've found is a lot in ministry, we tend to make all our sermons a marriage about values. How are we going to treat each other? Which is a good thing to talk about. And we read passages like Ephesians 5, which is beautiful. Ephesians 5, about how men are meant to love their wives in an initiating way, in a sacrificing way, like Christ loves the church. And women are meant to respond to their husbands like the church does to Christ. And we're meant to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, building one another up. There's all these great things about how we're supposed to treat each other, our values. But I've heard very few sermons about vision. Where is our marriage meant to go? But that's important. Marriage starts looking at one another face to face. But everyone in married knows this. You don't spend the rest of your life doing that. So let's just keep looking at each other. I love you so much. I love you too. I love you too. No, at some point, at some point in the ceremony, the pastor's up there and you're looking at each other and you're holding hands and you're crying a little bit and you put the rings on and then what does he do? He turns you both to face the world together. And then the last thing you do is he says, I am pleased to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Vincent. And everyone goes, ah. And then you grab hands and you walk out into the world together. Lord willing, the same direction, right? <laughs> but here's the issue, and this is a serious thing. Why do so many marriages break apart? What do people say? I hear it all the time. Our marriages, our lives went different directions. That's not a value statement. That's a vision statement. And what do they mean by that? They don't mean, well, I was a plumber and she was a librarian and, you know, they don't hang out as much. That's not about career. It's about overall arching vision. What is my life about? What is most meaningful to me? Because my vision will shape my goals. My goals shape my decisions. And so if you're single in here, you don't just marry someone who's cute, nice, funny, smart. You marry someone that's going the same direction. And the strongest marriages are the ones that are bound to each other and bound to what matters most. Friendships are about something. C.S. Lewis said it. That when he says the very condition of having friends is that we should want something besides friends. 
Friendship must be about something. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere have no fellow travelers. We must have something we're about. And a great marriage is a friendship where we say we are both about this together. And so as we talked about marriage, I could have taught Ephesians 5, which I love to do and it's amazing, but I wanted to focus on vision, the mission of marriage, because the strongest marriages I know are the marriages that are on mission. And here's the great news. The Bible gives us a picture of one. Actually, in the New Testament, we only get one godly married couple that we get to look at. Did you know that? Just one. And I bet many of us don't even know their name, right? But I bet if we can get our minds around this couple, we're going to see a marriage on mission. And they are not just going to have a healthy marriage. They are going to change the world. You and I are beneficiaries of this marriage we're about to look at, of Priscilla and Aquila. And as we look at them, we're going to see three things that were true of their marriage on mission that, Lord willing, will be true of ours, whether we're married now or not yet. And so to look at them, they're introduced in the book of Acts, chapter 18. The book of Acts is about after Jesus died and rose, what happened next? The people of Jesus spreading the name of Jesus. And the back half of Acts is a lot about the apostle Paul, who was single. We talked about last week. And he would go from place to place preaching the word of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 18, we see in verse 1, it says this. After this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They were Italian. I like them already. <laughs> but then we find out why they left, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. There's an interesting fact about that. Claudius was the emperor. This is one of the first extra-biblical sources we have that mentions Jesus. Did you know that? It, it's a source from Su Suetonius that tells us about this event. Suetonius wrote this, Claudius banished from Rome all the Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Crestus. And that's interesting. As Suetonius reports that, he says there was something going on in the Jewish community in Rome, some kind of issue around a guy named Crestus. And so the Roman emperor said, every Jew gets kicked out. And what's fascinating about that is most scholars agree that he's just mixing up the word Christus with the word Christos, which is the word Christ. Because when Paul would go and preach in different cities, he would go to the Jewish synagogues first. And as he said, Jesus is the Messiah you've been waiting for. Many believed and others got mad and usually a fight ensued by the end of it. And so when the gospel came to Rome of Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ, there was turmoil in the Jewish community and Claudius kicked them all out. And Priscilla and Aquila were part of that Jewish community that were kicked out. And so they left the capital city of Rome and they went to Corinth. And when they got to Corinth, Corinth was at the major junction of sea and land routes. It was a major trade city. And so they set up a business. They were leather workers. Specifically, they made tents, right? And here's what's significant. Paul, who's unashamedly a preacher of Jesus Christ, and everywhere he proclaims Jesus as the Christ, a fight breaks out goes and looks for this married couple who just got kicked out of their hometown because of people like him. And Paul's going to come find him. And it says in verse 2, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. And he worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now here's what's amazing about that. They're kicked out of their hometown. So they move to Corinth and they start a leather business. And then this guy who's been preaching Jesus and has riots following him all through the world shows up in their world. It would have been easy for them to say, oh, I don't know, we don't need any more drama. We're trying to move right now. We've got a lot going on. I'm starting a new business. I'm a little busy. They don't do that. <laughs> when they meet Paul, what happens? They say, live in our home. We'll employ you. And they supported Paul while he would go out every day and preach and try to persuade the Jews and Greeks that Jesus was the Christ. And then it says in verse 11, and he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God to them, that the apostle Paul, we're going to get the letters to the Corinthians out of this. We're going to get stories of the gospel breaking forth in the Mediterranean because of this moment. Why? Because a married couple was hospitable. Hospitable. That's the first point. 
that this married couple decided with their lives, we are going to be people who leverage our lives for what matters most, the vision of the glory of God in the world. If the message that God sent his son Jesus to save us is the most important message in the world, we're going to be about that. But here's the thing, they're not preachers. They don't do what I do. And yet what happens? They're hospitable people. They say, we will leverage what we have. So when Paul comes into town, they say, we have a home. Do you need a home to stay in? We have a home. We have money. We have a business. If our business will help leverage for what matters most, we're going to leverage our business for that. And what I love about that is they're a perfect picture of 1 Peter 4, where Peter says, show hospitality without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. What I love about that is Peter dismisses the idea that you have to be a vocational minister to make a difference for the kingdom. He says, if you speak, speak the oracles of God. Some of you, that's not what you do. But if you serve, serve with the strength he provides so that in all things he gets the glory. And Peter says, there are some that are meant to teach like this. There are others that you go, that's not what I do. But man, God has brought me along and I have things and I can leverage what I have for the greatest of all purposes. And what I love about Priscilla and Aquila is they do that. And this city will change because of them. And let me tell you something. I have seen couples like this all through ministry. God raises up people like this. For me, when I graduated from college, I moved here to spring to work at Faith Bridge. I was Ken's first hire. There were not many people here, definitely not many single people. So I spent a lot of time alone, quite frankly. Uh, I think I mentioned it last week on Friday nights. I would walk around Walmart and just think about how sad I was. Um, (laughs) And uh, things like that. And so I remember uh, I would set up, I made like a... You know those little trifold things you used to make uh, for science projects? You know, where you'd like stick little pictures on it and the little like crimped edges and be like, well, it's a picture of a volcano because I don't know, they blow up and stuff. I was never good at science. But you know, you'd get those little trifolds. I made one of those for our youth ministry. I mean, would you trust me with your kid? You know, you're walking in and I'm like, oh, here's a picture of me with a kid. And here's a picture of me with the same kid because we only got one kid right now. But, but we're on the move. And uh, <laughs> I remember setting up this little trifold. And my sister told me, hey, there's some people coming to town uh, that love Jesus and they love working with students. I think you're going to want to meet them. And uh, I said, okay. And she said, they're uh, Mark and Barkley Lozer, which Lozer spelled like loser. And I'm like, is this is a joke, like Barkley Lozer? Like, what is this like, what a sick joke? I'm already at the bottom. And um, I remember I was setting up my little trifold and uh, Barkley walked right up to me and she was like, hey, we're here and want to help. And I remember I was trying to be professional, like, well, we have an application I'll need you to fill out. And well, but I got choked up. I was like, well, we <laughs> really do you really want to help, you know? And uh, they invited me to their house that day to go have lunch with their family. And then throughout the rest of my time there, they were like, hey, come hang out with us here. Hey, have lunch here. Hey, come hang out with us at night and then just stay over here if you need to. And they were constantly welcoming me into their home. They were a very young couple. They got married while they were here. They didn't have a lot of money. And so they weren't necessarily giving a lot to the church, but they gave what they had. They had time to spend with me and they had time to love these kids. They built a youth ministry with me and they loved a lot of your kids. And there were people like that that began to come out of the woodwork, like the, like the Godwins who didn't even have kids in, in the junior high, high school range. But they said, but we have a living room. And if you need a place to meet, I was like, well, we need a place for middle school kids, which a lot of people would be like, no, God has certainly not called me to do that. <laughs> to let a bunch of 11-year-olds in my house. I'm sorry, he's been very clear. But they were like, bring them over. And we saw our youth ministry grow in the living room of the Godwins. And on and on, there were people like that that said, you know what, I'll give what I have. And I'll bring it to the table and God can use it. And people began to know Jesus, fall in love with Jesus, get healed from a lot of broken things and get a life on a trajectory of what matters most. Why? Because people said, I'll give what I have. That's beautiful. My wife does this so well. That when I met my wife, I said, Lord, I want to be on mission and I want to meet her on the mission field. And I met her, her band was leading worship at a place I was speaking. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. Someone that's chasing God as fast as I am. And man, she was traveling, leading worship all different places. But as we had kids, some of you know this, that tends to slow things down sometimes for women. 
And it becomes a question. Do you jump in the van with the band with the kids in tow? Probably not for a season. And so people would ask her all the time, what happened? Are you singing as much? And she was singing some, but as we had kids, there was, you could sense in some people's question, this dichotomy of, so are you done doing ministry? Can't, you know, kind of question. But what I watched my wife do is she's still creative. She's still singing. She's doing art actually more now than ever. But we got to a point where she would say, you know what? I'm raising kids. And there's some young ladies that have asked me questions about this or that. I say, Hey, look, I don't have time to go get coffee with you, but come over. Come over, eat lunch with my kids. They're going to throw food everywhere and we'll put them down for a nap and then we'll talk for a few minutes, right? And then other girls, she would talk to them and she would say, you know what? I got to run some errands. If you want to jump in with me and go to the grocery store, that's great. And she would begin to do stuff like that. And all around our home, there has always been an orbit of young women, young women that just want to be around my wife. And for many of them, being invited into a home with a family means the world because they don't have that. And that doesn't mean let any stranger into your home, but the reality is Priscilla and Aquila realized our life is about the things of God, and so we'll leverage what we have for the things of God. And some of you, maybe the most you're doing is throwing a few bucks towards a worthy cause, maybe volunteering here or there, and your life has none of the, none of the passion of being on mission. But a Priscilla and Aquila are on fire, and the world changes because of a couple that says, we're the Lord's. And whatever hardships come, whatever difficulties come, if we have to move suddenly, if our business changes, whatever we have, be it much or little, we're about the things of God. And when you position yourself like that, God will use a couple like that. And you see this couple change a city. It gets complicated there. Paul gets arrested. Synagogue leader gets beaten up. It gets a little crazy. They end up exiting Corinth and they go with Paul to Ephesus. And the passage really, we won't read it all, but it really wants to make sure you know Priscilla and Aquila had to move again and they moved with Paul. These were difficult days in the early life of the church. And they land in Ephesus, which was another major city. And then Paul leaves them. He had to go back to Antioch. And so he moves this married couple to Ephesus with Paul. And then they land in Ephesus alone. And Luke really wants to stress that that's what's happening. And you're like, why? Because you see something go down in Acts 18.24. After Paul exits, Priscilla and Aquila have a different situation. In Acts 18.24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So here's a fascinating moment. This couple's in this new city. They're attending the synagogue. Paul's left. And this preacher gets up that's talented, fiery, but inaccurate. He's got bad theology. Question, if you're a Jesus-loving couple in the church and someone gets up front that begins to teach bad theology, what do you do? What are Priscilla and Aquila going to do? Post a video of it on YouTube, right? (laughs) With the headline false teaching in Ephesus, right? Or tweet about it. So sad the synagogue isn't authentic anymore. You know, something like that? Or if that's too much, they're like, we're not trolls. We'll just go to brunch with our friends. And they say, hey, how's the synagogue today? And you're like, you know, I don't know if we're going to keep going there. You know, just the way they're doing things up front. I don't really have a lot of confidence in synagogues. We're out. Is that what they do? Let's watch. It says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Isn't that awesome? They didn't sit there and go, oh, as they heard him preach, didn't go, man, I wish Paul was here to tell him what's up. You know, Paul knows what's up. We read all Paul's books. We're kind of Paul people. They don't do that. They don't go, man, somebody should help that guy. They're sitting out there And they go, that guy doesn't have the benefit we had of hearing the teaching we have. And you know what? We had the benefit of living with Paul. And so they don't blast the guy publicly. You're a false teacher. They don't walk up to him in front of a crowd and be like, hey, man, you don't really know what you're saying. Which podcast are you listening to? They don't rip him. But what do they do? They see a moment of crisis. They don't say somebody should do something. What do they say? They move towards him. And they find the most loving way to engage him. They pull him aside 
And then they find a bold way to engage him. They speak the truth to him in love. And what's going to happen? Apollos is going to come to know Jesus. And by the end of Apollos' ministry, it says he crossed to Achaia. The brothers encouraged him. He wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. And he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing them by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. And you see in the letter to the Corinthians, Apollos is mentioned seven times. Paul will put Apollos' ministry at the same level of his and the Apostle Peter's, that this couple, and here's your second point, was game. They were game. You go, what do I mean by that? Let me read you a definition if you don't know what the word game means. Eager and willing to do something challenging. That's what I love about them. A marriage that's on mission is one that has deeply taken in Ephesians 2, where Ephesians 2 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. That they understood when we're brought to Jesus, God has good works prepared for us every day and we don't know what they are. And they may be what we do for a living or they may be this random conversation. They may be our boss or they may be the homeless guy. They may be that kid over there or they may be that minister over there. I don't know, but God is going to bring people into our world and every day there's good works to walk into and we're going to have eyes to see them and hearts to feel them and ears to hear. So when they see a problem with Apollos, they don't go, man, I wish someone would do something. They say, what are we meant to do, God? What are we meant to do? How can we be a part? If there's a problem, Lord, let us be a part of the solution. And that's a hallmark of a marriage on mission. I want to be a part of what God's doing in the situation, and I will jump into whatever he has for me. Man, we had a couple like that in College Station. Ryan Bingham was a young man that was the captain of my prayer team at Breakaway. And he would lead students in prayer all through Breakaway. They would stay underneath the bowels of these auditoriums and pray for these kids as we would preach the gospel to them. And then Ryan graduated, but he stayed in town. And I remember once as we were preparing for breakaway, uh, someone came to me and they said, hey, do you know that like Ryan's hanging out on Northgate a lot? Northgate was like where the heavy party crowd was. And I was like, uh, no. And they're like, yeah, we always see him like walking around the dorms over there. I'm like, okay, well, he graduated. Is he like living the memories or what's he doing over there? I don't know. And so finally, inevitably, I got around to asking Ryan what he's doing. He was a little sheepish about it, but he began to explain to me, you know what? Every day in college when I would drive to Breakaway to go lead my team, I saw all these kids just hanging out at the dorms, hanging out on Northgate, and they weren't going to Breakaway. He said, and so when I graduated and wasn't a team leader anymore, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go there, and I'm going to sit with them. Sometimes he brought food and like grilled out with them, and then I'm going to invite them to come with me. And it was a normal thing to see Ryan, who had graduated, wasn't officially a part of Breakaway with a handful of kids that he wasn't officially in charge of, that he had just invited to Breakaway, and they were there. It wasn't uncommon to see Ryan sitting on a park bench praying with people. And he wasn't necessarily like the most outgoing human being, but he was just there. I saw a need, and I moved towards it. There was a crisis pregnancy center in town, and he would volunteer there. And as he volunteered there, he noticed that, you know what? When these young girls come in that are in crisis, they have lady counselors that instantly grab them and begin to help them, give them options, walk them through how they're going to do that. And the boyfriends or husbands or whoever just kind of sit in the lobby and read magazines or whatever until that moment's over. And so Ryan would volunteer and he said, you know what? I'm not just going to do the handyman stuff. I'll sit with these guys. And he began to counsel these young men. And after a while, he quit his construction job and did that full time and would minister to these young men. There was a strip club in town and there was a ministry that started that would go in and pray for the girls that would work in the strip club. Ryan did not go in and pray with the girls. <laughs> but Ryan would stand out front with the bouncers and just talk with them while the girls were inside, bringing gifts and prayers to the women that were working inside. The strip club closed down, which was something a lot of us had prayed for. But the reality is a lot of these women were doing that because they had to pay bills and it put them in a really stressful situation of what do they do with their families. And Ryan and his wife, Emily, who was serving at one of the more difficult schools in town because she wanted her teaching degree to make a difference in the hurting people of the world, they began to help and were a part of that community that were helping these girls find good jobs so they could provide for their kids. And I just look at Ryan and Emily and you know what? Not many people know their name. Not many people in Bryan College Station know who they are. But let me tell you something. They are seeing where the fabric of society is breaking in their city 
and they're willing to be a part of the solution and they are changing a culture. And I could introduce you to one after another, young scared kids, young scared couples, young moms, young children that are different because a Ryan and an Emily Bingham were game, ready to be a part of whatever God has for them. And I want you to be like that. The world is a mess. And the typical MO for human beings is to complain about it and like or dislike something vociferously online. <laughs> and that solves nothing, really. But there's hurt right here in your neighborhood. And all of us, man, if we're game, lives change because of people like that who come into their churches saying, I'm not gonna come in to criticize, I'm gonna come to pray. Who look at their leaders like Ken on that screen and go, man, I'm not gonna evaluate whether or not what he's doing is working for me. I'm gonna pray that God would work powerfully for him. And then I'm gonna look around this community and say, what are the needs here? And God, how would you like our family to be a part? I had dinner with a couple the other day and we're sitting in this restaurant and they told me in the middle of dinner, they're like, you know what we do, Ben? We as a couple pray and we ask God, Lord, where are you moving? And then we look to see where God is moving. And then our family supports that. And I'm like, what a cool thing. And as I talked to them, they got so excited about that, that yeah, he works in this industry, she does that. But the reality is their marriage is about scanning the horizon and to see where God is working. And then they put their energy behind that. And they are a passionate, wonderful couple. And I want that for you to be hospitable, opening up my house for whatever God needs and to be game, opening up my life and my time and my energy and my voice for whatever God may have me do. And the last thing Priscilla and Aquila were is they were faithful. They're faithful. Paul's going to mention them in three of his letters. And I want you to see what comes up as he does it. The first one he mentions them in is 1 Corinthians. He wrote Corinthians while he was staying in Ephesus, and he closed with this statement, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches in Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something about that, a couple things. Number one, did you notice he switches their names? Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, he'll alternate them. And you go, why? Because I think he does that to show it wasn't just one of them was involved in the things of God and the other one was kind of dragged along. It wasn't like, well, the wife's real involved in the church and the guy shows up when he has to. It's like, no, Aquila and Priscilla together were chasing the things of God. And so Paul will alternate their names. Did you notice also it says, greet them together with the church in their house? Apparently the tent business was doing pretty good in Ephesus, right? That a whole church can meet in their house. But I love that about them. They're opening up their living room. I love this baptism videos. I don't know where those pools were. They were at somebody's house. I don't got a pool. You're not getting baptized in my house. But man, that's pretty awesome. I can't think of a better way to use a pool. And that's pretty cool. And these people open up their home. You see him a few years later when Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 16.3. It says, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Gre Notice that's in Rome. So they got to move back. And when they moved back to Rome, the church is meeting in their house. Tent business is doing real good. Greet my beloved something or other who was the first convert in Christ in Asia. <laughs> Couple other things to point out. I want you to notice, some of you go, well, wait a minute. I thought her name was Priscilla. Why does he keep calling her Prisca? Prisca was her formal name. Uh, Priscilla was a diminutive form of Prisca. Uh, it's like a pet name. It would be like... Um, Hermana is sister, Hermanita, little sister. And it's also a term of endearment, right? Uh, Priscilla, which you find out, which they've been called all through the book of Acts, was not her name she would introduce herself if she was formally meeting you the first time. When Paul's writing this formal letter to the Romans he did not know, he introduces her as Prisca. But when she would hang with him and Luke and the boys, they called her Priscilla, my little Hermanita, right? And what that shows you is they weren't just volunteering at Paul's church. They were family. They loved each other, and I love that. The Apostle John says, I have no greater joy than seeing that my children are walking in the truth. And he wasn't talking about his biological kids. He's talking about the people he gets to walk with with Jesus. And you see, they were deep friends. And not just deep friends. Did you notice it says, they risked their necks for my life? 
When did that happen? We have no idea. It might be when they had to flee earlier. We don't know. We're not going to know till we get to ask them personally, right? At the end of all things, we'll just walk up to Priscilla and Aquila. And I want to ask them, say, hey, in Romans, when did you risk your necks for Paul's life? But I love that. Up until the end, there's no cost too high to pay for the purpose of Jesus. And then 10 years later, in AD 66, Paul writes the last letter we have for him, 2 Timothy. And he's writing it to his young protege, Timothy. Paul's in prison, and Paul expects to die in prison. And most commentators believe he died fairly soon after that. And as he's writing this letter, it's really kind of his last will and testament to the young man that he got to carry along with him in ministry, Timothy. And as he closes Timothy, the letter, he writes in 2 Timothy 4, 19, greet Prisca and Aquila. And I love that. Paul, as he is fading out in a prison cell, about to die and his ministry is over, he looks over across the horizon and sees his young Timothy and says, carry on in the work, Timothy, and grip the word that's been entrusted to you. And then he looks right next to Timothy and he sees Prisca and Aquila and he says, and tell them hi for me. And I love that. This couple's faithful, faithful all the way to the end. Ministry is not just a young person's game. Anyone can be a part of it. One of the most inspirational things for me in ministry was when I first came here and I got to hang out with Jack and Sammy Walker. It started by accident. I was trying to learn how to write sermons and I was trying to find a place to escape to write sermons and I had heard they had a lake house. So I asked them, hey, do you mind if I use your lake house to write sermons? They're like, well, we're on our way there. Why don't you join us? And I was like, I don't actually know. And then what do I say? Like, no, I just wanted your house. I just, I don't want you. You don't say that. So what you do is you end up on vacation with a sweet older couple, right? And uh, we all rode together and uh, went to their house. And it was the coolest thing. They would go shopping during the day while I wrote sermons. And then we would sit at night in rocking chairs and watch the sunset and talk. And I was like, this is actually pretty cool. I didn't think vacationing with some 70-year-olds could be this awesome. But it turned out being great. Highly recommend it. But one of the things that was most amazing for me was we would sit on that back porch. You know what we would talk about? What they were learning in the Bible. Because before they went to bed every night, they would, they would read uh, Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. And they would tell me, well, it said this, and this is what I think that means, and we're praying about this. And they were talking about what the implications of it for their life. He would volunteer in prison ministry. They had different areas in the church they were serving. And I watched this couple and I thought, God, I want to be like that. I want to be a couple that grips hands together and we run after the things of Jesus all the way to the end. Priscilla and Aquila were like that, faithful to the end. Jack and Sammy are like that, faithful to the end. And that's what builds a strong marriage. There's room for us to run together. We're on the same path together. Our lives aren't drifting apart into other interests. Our lives are speeding up as we race into the greatest of all interests. That's what I want for my life and for yours. So Voyage of the Dawn Treader. There's a moment in the journey where it gets tough. And some people think about quitting. And there in the midst of that, there's a little rat that was part of their team, little talking rat. I don't have time to go into it if you haven't read the story. He's adorable though. And they're at this moment where it's difficult. What do we do? Do we keep sailing or do we part ways here? And reap a cheap, the little rat stands up and he says this. While I can, I sail east in the Dawn Treader. That was the direction of their king. He says, and when she fails me, I will paddle east in my coracle. And when she sinks, I'll swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I've not reached Aslan's country or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I will sink with my nose to the sunrise. That's how we're meant to be that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth and he leveraged everything he had for our good. His time, his energy, all of it, his words were what? To live the perfect life we could not. And then he spilled his blood that he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be right with God. He took on the penalty and the shame of our guilt. He let it kill him. He gave his very life for us. And then he rose from the grave victorious and he's building a kingdom of people who will trust him and love him. And then he says, follow me, run with me, go on my great commission and I will be with you. 
and a God who's given that much for us, the most natural thing to do is say, then I give all back to him. And when we get on his mission and are about his purposes, the most wonderful incident occurs as we're about his mission, he weaves us closer together as a marriage. As we are about his purposes, we get greater intimacy. That's what I want for you, a marriage like this, deepening in intimacy, shot through with impact. That's what Priscilla and Aquila had. And so my hope for you is not that you both have common interests in certain sports or certain endeavors, but that you would aim your marriage at what matters most. And I'll tell you when you do that, your marriage will not just be a blessing to each other as the years go by. Cities change that way. Cultures change that world. Worlds change that way when marriages are on mission. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you that you came on mission for us, that your son came charging in the dark to rescue us. And Lord, I believe there's some here today, whether married or single, that's not the relationship that's most important right now in their life. The most important one is the relationship with you. And God, I just believe there's some men in here, some women, that that's the relationship they need to get right. That's why they're here today. It's because they need to know God, that you love them. Before they start thinking about a relationship with a guy or a girl, they need a relationship with God, and it comes through the God-man Jesus Christ who went on mission for you, who came for you, lived for you, died for you, rose for you, forgives you, heals you. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You get a relationship with God and adoption into his family and the resources to be a blessing to whoever he might put you with. And God, I just believe there's some people in here today who say, I want that. I want him. And I want to do something just with all our eyes closed and head bowed. I just, I want you to pray. I want to pray with you if that's you, but I would love to see you. And I don't want people looking around, but if that's you today, could you do me a favor and just raise a hand? Let me know you're out there. Even in some of the different rooms. Okay. I see on the right, several of you. All right, down front. Awesome. Right here in the middle, I see you. That's great. Well, I'd invite you if that's you to, to pray to him and say, Lord, I need you. Like Ken talked about in the video, Lord, that Jesus died and rose, and I want my old life buried and a new life to rise. You tell him, I want that. Forgive me, adopt me, bring me into your family. And you rejoice today that God loves to adopt people into his home. And then God, for the rest of us, before we speed on into the next thing and just get into the grind of life, I pray you would give us a holy moment right now. And I know for some of us, when the guy up front quits speaking, that's usually when we're kind of start thinking about lunch or whatever. And I just want to charge you right now. Don't move on to the next moment. But even right now, I want to give you a moment, just a moment before we close to pray. And I want you to ask him, God, what would it look like for my marriage to be on mission? God, what would it look like for us as a couple or as a family to be about your purposes? What are some changes we could make? What are some things you're calling us to? What, what do I as a husband need to do? What do I as a wife need to do to make sure our marriage is about linking arms together and running into the sunrise? Ask him for a vision of that. And I want to invite you here. I'm going to give you a moment. It's going to be quiet for a minute, and I want you to pray. And some of you, you're not married yet, and that's okay. Maybe you'll just pray that for your life. Maybe some of you as a couple, you want to hold hands and pray one of you out loud. It would be totally okay if across these rooms we heard the murmur of couples praying over their marriages. Actually, I think that could be pretty awesome. But before we step out of these rooms, let's offer our marriages and our lives up to God and his purposes because it's not just the best thing for the world, it's the best thing for us. And so I want to invite you now, just before we begin to sing, before we wrap up, even now, begin to pray. Ask him. Ask him to do a mighty work in your marriage and in your family. As a couple, pray together. Single, if you're here alone, that's okay. You pray alone, and we'll pray along with you, and then we'll all join in singing to our God together. But take this moment now and offer our marriages and our lives to him. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Ben Stewart, who just brought a message about marriage. Hey, Ben. Hey. Welcome back. Thanks. So last week, we talked about singleness. Right. Today, we talked about marriage. Yes. Um, and there's also things that we've been keeping up to date on you. You're giving us updates on your church and the book and all the things that are happening. And so we actually had a question come in around those things. Okay, um, great. Yeah. And so I'm just going to start with that. So uh, the question came in that said, how do we get to Ben's church in DC? Uh, yeah, generously. <laughs> no, um, actually, uh, Ken and I have talked about that, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot I can say now, but I'm coming back in November, and between here and there, Ken has a plan he's rolling out of, of how Faith Bridge can be a part of that. So I'm really excited about it and grateful for it, and so I'm thrilled you asked that question. Stay tuned because Pastor Ken's going to tell you exactly how. Exciting. And now we know that you're going to be back in November. Coming back. Which is awesome. Yeah. So good to know. Yeah. Um, and also, tell me, between now and November, does your book come out? When does your book come out officially? Yes. I know uh, we can pre-order it. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. You can. Uh, it comes out in September, mm -hmm. mid-September. Okay. So September 12th, All right. actually. Good. So mm -hmm. by the time you come back, we'll have read it. It will. Yeah. Uh, okay. So tell us more about it, what the book is, is directed towards and for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, the basic layout is it's called single dating, engaged, married, mm -hmm. and really the book breaks into four sections, each of those sections. And my goal in each one is to talk about what are God's purposes for each stage. And then how do you maximize the benefits that stage mm -hmm. affords and minimize the difficulties of that stage. Mm -hmm. And then with each one, I do a case study of someone in the Bible who did that stage well. Oh, okay. So like in singleness, it's a case study on Paul and mm -hmm. then Song of Solomon, Isaac and Rebecca, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. So I did mm -hmm. that part here today. But um, so there's a couple chapters on each section. And really that's why, you know, everyone says in their book, there's something for everybody. But I mean, for me, it was a burden of seeing our relationships mm -hmm. are, are increasingly becoming, man, more difficult and tragic. And I just, there's, for me, this was not like I'm going to set out to write a book on love, but it was, mm -hmm. it was birthed out of watching my young single mm -hmm. friends and my married friends mm -hmm. struggle, struggle and going, man, if we can get a vision for God's purpose for relationships, I think we'll all be a lot happier. So. Awesome. That's the goal. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so between now and you come back, you have a lot of exciting things happening. Yes. Yes, you do. How uh, can Faith Bridge be praying for you guys in this season? Yeah, that's really sweet of you to ask. So um, our plan as a family is to move in August. Okay. And that's really the big prayer request. We've got mm -hmm. some an opportunity of where we might live and where the church might meet that's pretty amazing that we mm -hmm. would love to see happen. Mm -hmm. And so we're praying for that. But in the midst of that, we're praying for where the stewards can live, mm -hmm. where's the church going to gather, mm -hmm. and then who's coming with us. Mm -hmm. And so the where and the who, and then the how financially, those are the big three pieces. Okay. And so the plan is to move in August and to start a small group community in the fall with the goal to launching big with a conference in January and then some worship nights in Exciting times. So, yeah. yeah so. All right. Well, we will be joining you in prayer. Thank and you. And excited yep. to have you back. Thanks. Praying for your book and all the things that are happening in the Stewart's family. So, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, we'll looking forward back. to seeing God move. Thanks. All right, and thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.